Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for, co for coming tonight. Um, we are very excited that you are here. My name is Leslie Wade and I am a volunteer board member of the North American Fruit Explorers. This is our 2021 virtual co uh, conference, Fruit Forward, Growing for Tomorrow. Um, we call it uh, the organization NAFEX for short. So you'll hear that acronym. And I'll be serving as the facilitator tonight for this session. It's called Peaches Grown by Southwestern Native Americans. Before I introduce our speaker, I would like to share a few housekeeping items and a little bit about NAFEX as we allow more people to join. First, this is a webinar. So unlike Zoom meetings, participants audio and video features are automatically disabled. Second, we encourage you to ask questions. Please use the Q&A tab in Zoom to ask topical questions or technical support questions of our co-host. Third, if you are newer to Zoom, you can adjust your screen view and some of your Zoom settings on your device to control the appearance. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available to our members and conference participants at nafex.org. As we go through session by session in this uh, virtual conference, we are uploading those videos within 24 hours. So a few, um, and let me also add, they'll be available on our website for a year for our members. And then after that, we hope to move these videos to our uh, YouTube channel. So a couple words about NAFEX. So founded in 1967, the North American Fruit Explorers is a network of individuals throughout the US and Canada devoted to the discovery, cultivation, and appreciation of superior varieties of fruits and nuts. Although the ranks of our membership include professional palmologists, nursery owners, and commercial orchardists, NAFEX members are all amateurs in the truest sense of the word, and they are motivated by their love of fruit. NAFEX members share ideas, information, experience, and propagating material via our website, our social media channels. We have an amazing Facebook group with more than 5,000 people that is super active. Uh, through our fruit-specific fruit interest groups, uh, and our annual conferences like this one. So whether we hold these conferences in person or online or both, we hope that you'll stay connected and, and stay involved in those. As a paid NAFEX member, you also get four editions of our Pomona Journal each year, as well as the ability to search 50 years of Pomona's in our digital library. It's an impressive collection of invaluable information about fruit and you're able to do a search uh, by word, which is really nice. The organization exists because of fruit growing members like you. So we encourage you to continue your membership and become actively involved in the interest group uh, that we have or as a committee member or as a board member. So please visit our website to learn more at nafex.org. So now it is my pleasure to introduce our special guest, Tonight, we're joined by Reagan Whitesalusi. Reagan is currently the Agriculture, Natural Resources, and 4-H Extension Assistant Professor for San Juan County, Utah State University, or USU, Extension. She is Diné member raised in Gallup, New Mexico. Reagan completed her master's degree in the summer of 2019 at USU, focused on studying underutilized traditional Native American food crops including horticultural practices, genetic diversity, and cultural importance. Her completed research encompasses various agricultural and ethnographic approaches to understanding the significance of the Southwest peach and Navajo spinach to the Navajo, Hopi, and Zuni nations. Reagan currently works to provide educational programming in animal and plant sciences and collaborating in state efforts to successfully propagate native food plants to encourage local sustainability within Native American communities. Welcome, Reagan. Hi, Leslie, thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm so glad I, you're here. Do you wanna start by just telling us a little bit about your story? Absolutely. That um, would be great. Okay, I'm gonna start pulling out my presentation as well. Sure. Um, okay, so I, uh, again, as Leslie said, I grew up in Gallup, New Mexico. Um, I actually grew up very westernized and um, 
it wasn't until I was about 15 that I started to understand a little bit about my, uh, my background of being Native American. Um, my father was a business owner, and so a lot of our upbringing was in a business focused world. And so we would travel for my dad's meetings and such. And it was, um, it was a great experience. It, it got me to see a lot of what was out there, a lot of uh, resources that were available, how other communities functioned. And, um, and so when I started to learn about uh, being Diné, um, I learned more about who I was. So I am um, Native Americans, we identify ourselves also by uh, clans. Uh, we have our name that's given to us, but uh, we have four clans. So my first clan is Nakai Dene, which is the Mexican clan. And I was uh, born for Sejikini, which is the honeycomb clan, or the it's also known as the cliff dwelling people's clan. Um, and then my uh, paternal, or sorry, my maternal clan on uh, my mother's side is uh, Bilagana, which means white. It's a common term that, uh, that can have some negativity towards it, but, um, but it's a very descriptive term uh, just to mean by color. And then um, my uh, paternal clan on my dad's side is Torachini, which is the bitter water clan. And it's one of the first four clans of the Navajo people when uh, we go back all the way to the origins of our people's creation story. So um, there's kind of a, a mix about me. Um, as you can tell, I've identified myself. Um, I am uh, half Navajo. I am also a quarter uh, Mexican and I am a quarter white. So I'm uh, I like to call myself uh, a mixed mutt sometimes, but I'm also very uh, culturally engulfed and diverse, and I have a lot of family history that I've been able to um, understand from my family, and a lot of what I uh, did in searching for the education that I wanted to, and actually how I started down this trail was uh, when I was having a life-changing experience. I was actually going to uh, business school um, and I realized that wasn't for me and I didn't know what to do. And me as an individual, I don't like to sit idle in a place. If I don't know the direction that I'm going, I, I get very uncomfortable. I have to figure out the direction. I, I don't like to waste time. I have to move forward. I have to be progressive and productive. And so I had a heart to heart with my dad and um, he says, well, if you don't like what you're doing, you don't like where you're going. He says, uh, I says, dad, you know, you know me, you raised me. Do you know who I am? Do you think you can understand what I would like to do? Because I'm having an identity crisis here. And he says, agriculture may be something that you're interested in. He says, that's something that I wanted to do, but maybe it's something that you should do. And he says, um, there's a peach that we used to grow too that uh, we don't see around anymore. He grew up in a, uh, in a Navajo community called Shanto. It's in Arizona. Um, if any of you have ever been to Four Corners area, it's between Cayenta, Arizona and Page, Arizona areas. And uh, so a lot of my family and relatives are out in, in those communities out between those two main developed areas. And um, he says, we grew peaches in Shanto Canyon. He also grew up uh, herding sheep down into Inscription House Canyon. And uh, both of those places had fruit trees. And he says, man, I just remember the taste of those. And it was one of the best things to have. It was like eating candy at the end of the year. And he says, sometimes we would just eat peaches all day and then we'd have belly aches at the end of the day but they were so good he says I miss those peaches you can't find them anymore he used to see them all over the place it used to be you know even if you weren't growing them that they would still be found because there was a lot of people growing them at the time and he says now you can't find them anymore and so uh, I decided to go down that pathway and um, I started my first semester at Utah State University I actually transferred out of Brigham Young University. Um, I'm not I'm not affiliated with the uh, LDS Church. 
but I went to school there because my parents had gone to school there and, um, and they said it has a good business school. And so that's how I left the first institution, the first year of my college education and went to Utah State University. And when I went there, uh, getting a horticulture background uh, was something that I wanted to do because I had a, a focus of I, I want to come back to my communities and help my people uh, become productive again in agriculture. So my education and, uh, and my foundation of which I started my master's program uh, was the focus that I could be very uh, well-rounded in any area of agriculture. Uh, I may not have specialized in every area of agriculture. Um, I specialized in horticulture specifically, but um, I do understand a lot of the different aspects uh, and areas that uh, make up all of agriculture. And so that prepared me well for my job. And I also uh, started out doing extension internships as a, as a young um, undergraduate. And uh, that is actually what led me to the path of uh, working under the fruit specialist for the state of Utah in extension. And, um, and through that, I pitched the idea of, of asking him what he knows about about peach production and if he can maybe help give me some pointers of the direction that I needed to go and that I wanted to find the peaches specifically and help bring back agriculture and he was just so intrigued he says peaches do you like what do you know about them and I said well as far as I know um, there's you know some history I knew absolutely none of the history behind the peaches I just said that my dad had been growing them and that his grandparents so that they were there before them and they've been growing them for a very long time and he says tell me a little bit more about the fruit like what do you know about it and I was like well I've been told that they're white flesh peach and they're very small like the size of an an apricot or an almond and he was just so intrigued he and he'll tell you to this day little did he know that Native Americans grew peaches and that we were very successful at it and so he says, here's what I think you should do. Let's get you on some graduate, um, undergraduate research projects and let's go on this journey and uh, let's see if we can get you some funding and you can do a master's degree. And I was thinking at this time, whoa, 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 I just wanted to do a bachelor's degree. Um, and I thought master's degree, graduate school, that's a big step. Not a lot of people get to that point. And um, I was thinking, how am I gonna do this? You know. So that's how my journey started. Um, and I'll go ahead and uh, begin my presentation now and we'll continue talking and, and joining on this journey together. But uh, it definitely is, um, as we go through this, it definitely is uh, a life-changing experience for myself, uh, a big engulfment into my culture, which I still don't know a lot about but I have been learning and now I feel like I can join in on, um, on the rest of uh, my family and the understanding of what it means to be um, Native American, what it means to be Diné, um, and what it means to, to carry the name that I um, carry and, um, and represent my people. So um, if, for those of you who are a little unfamiliar with the area, uh, the Navajo Reservation is that big giant red spot that crosses uh, into the Four Corners boundaries. So the it crosses into Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. And I love to have this map here specifically uh, because when I did my research, I actually worked with three Native American tribes in the Southwest. I worked with Hopi, I worked with the Zuni tribe, and I worked with uh, the tribe that I am enrolled in, Navajo. Uh, and I grew up in Gallup, so that gives a good proximity to where I grew up, um, the whole area, and uh, what that kind of looks like, and all the tribes, and where they're located, and, and the adventures that I went on for seven years of my life, and uh, still currently going on in future adventures today. So I will um, share this with you. This is a recent picture. I just harvested these peaches, but I wanted to show you kind of where I'm at now um, and then talk to you a little bit about my journey. But uh, I love this picture because you can see the smile on my face. We just harvested this season, these peaches. Um, and I'll talk to you about this orchard a little bit more. But 
um, looking looking at where I'm at now um, and the, ba the basis of why I started the research I did. So uh, ironically, my dad is a business owner, but he owned McDonald's restaurants on the Navajo reservation. And um, he sold them back in, I believe, 2010. Uh, which has been some of the discussion for some of the health circumstances um, on, on our Navajo reservation. Um, but these circumstances are also found throughout tribal communities across the United States as well. Um, but the Navajo Nation being as large as it is and as vast as it is, uh, we call and are considered a food desert in our communities. So uh, fresh food is scarce. Um, the interest in, in traditional agriculture practices and actually doing it is being lost with our elders as they pass on. Uh, right now we have one in three people who suffer from diabetes and um, obesity. The obesity rate is three times the national average. Um, and so a lot of the work that I'm doing is kind of a foundation to start uh, approaching um, to counter the current uh, diet circumstances. So there's a lot of um, convenience stores throughout the Navajo Nation. I believe there's, uh, don't quote me on this exact number, but estimated 13 grocery stores in the span of the Navajo Nation, which is roughly the size of uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, and uh, Massachusetts together. So massive land space. And um, this, this is kind of the direction where I wanted to start. So uh, the Southwest peach here, I wanted to share this picture with you. Um, I'm holding one of these peaches and it's very small. Um, this is one of the most beautiful peaches that I had the privilege of tasting. Um, and then I also thought um, uh, the, the red flesh was something unique and interesting to kind of look at. I'd never seen a white flesh peach in our area in any of the areas. This was the first tree that I collected that had that red flesh. Um, I did not grow out any seeds from that specific tree, but it was definitely one of the most tasty and delicious that I had. I'll go on a little bit and talk to you about the flavor as we get a little bit deeper. Um, but I want to first share with you uh, the importance of uh, the history of this this crop and um, going down and looking at the health circumstances, um, I started this endeavor first needing to understand and learn about the peach and the history. You know, what information was exactly out there that was written about. Um, I knew, I didn't know much. Um, I only knew what my dad told me. And um, there's not a lot of publication on the information of these trees. So, What's been told and written about is that the peaches in the Southwest were introduced by the Spanish and um, they were thought to have spread uh, between the tribes through trading ahead of the European settlers into the Southwest. Um, so that uh, there's literature in uh, Spanish literature that I've gone through that indicate that upon the Spaniards arrival into the Zuni area and then into Hopi, that the peaches were growing in abundance in Hopi specifically, not in Zuni, um, but in Hopi, that they were hundreds and hundreds um, to count. And the Native American people were very successful at growing them and, and getting massive amounts of food resources from these fruit trees. Um, then there's a big gap. That's, you know, the first account. Um, and that's probably the only account that uh, I've heard of in the Southwest. As we continue to move forward in time, there is another reported history uh, when the Navajo people were beginning to uh, to cause a lot of raiding. There was uh, the United States moving into the Western countries. Um, there was, you know, manifest destiny uh, going on at that time. And the Navajo people as spread out as, as our people were, uh, were one of the hardest tribes to, I guess, control and have treaty agreements signed. There were several treaties that were signed, I think over 14, but only seven of those were uh, what they call ratified. So only official treaties that were 
that were signed. Uh, but because the Navajo community was so spread out, um, there were certain groups of Navajo that signed the treaty and then there were others that did not. And so raiding continued for such a long time. Um, and so around the Civil War period, um, that was that was going on at the time that General James Carleton uh, was brought into the Southwest and uh, he started to set up a reservation uh, space for the Navajo people at Bosque Redondo. I'll show you a, a map here in a minute. Um, but as time continued to go on, there was uh, Captain uh, Kit Carson who was ordered to force the Navajo, in, Navajo into this reservation. And it was so hard to get them wound up. If any of you have been into uh, Canyon de Chez National Monument area, um, these canyons have over a hundred trails that go uh, from the base of the canyon up the canyon walls. And these canyon walls can be a hundred feet in height. And then on top of these canyon walls, you have the Colorado Plateau, which is what uh, where a lot of the, the driving and the roads uh, go in between the communities on the Navajo reservation. And uh, within these canyons, uh, there was a lot of hiding places. The Native Americans that uh, grew crops in here, I often call it the breadbasket of the Navajo nation. This was the heartbeat of the people and their food source in a lot of these areas. So the best way to control people is to starve them out, I guess. And that's what the tactic was for the cavalry that was in the area at the time. And so they did uh, began the process of the systematic crop destruction. Uh, they killed livestock. Uh, the Navajo are well known for their, their sheep and their wool, their Navajo rugs uh, made from the sheep wool. And it was through that they started starting with the livestock, then they also started to tear out the annual crops. In um, a little bit, as we get closer to winter, you know, this kind of kept going on. So year after year, they were making sure that the, Na the Navajo people wouldn't be able to grow their crops. The food storages started to begin to get depleted. And um, the last thing that remained was the fruit trees. And so in order to phase out that tactic, they ended up cutting down all the fruit trees. And it's estimated that they cut down over 4,500 fruit trees throughout both Canyon del Muerto and Canyon de Chez that make up the Canyon, uh, Canyon de Chez National Monument area. So once, once uh, that happened, the Navajo people actually surrendered. They were taken over to Fort Defiance. Um, they had more than 8,500 uh, Navajo people at Fort Defiance. And that's actually a low estimate. Um, our people in our community say, well, there was probably more. So they were forced to walk all the way over to Bosque Redondo. And uh, they resided there for about four years. And then they were allowed to return home. And along the way, um, our people were, if there was elderly that was slow, they were shot on sight so the, the group could continue moving. Same thing with uh, the sick, with children. Um, children were sometimes given away or left behind. Um, and so uh, not many of our people returned, but when we did return, this is where um, I love to bring in some of my family history. Um, we, uh, my, my great grandfather, who's written about in the uh, Atlas article that's been shared about me, he was called a generous man. Uh, because he was able to round up the livestock that was left behind, that was abandoned. Um, and he also raided into the Calvary uh, sites and took their livestock. He raided down into Mexico. Uh, he raided the Utes. Uh, and he was taking livestock because our people were being attacked and we were vulnerable at the time. And so he had a massive amount of livestock clock um, he kept our family safe in areas of Navajo Mountain. I'll show you where that is on the map soon. And he also cared for fruit trees and planted them as well. And that sustained my family. And so when the, when the rest of our people came back from the long walk, he started to give um, herds away to families and allowing them to settle back into the lands. And they called him the generous one after. Um, but ironically, he was called the angry one before 
the people had left. <laughs> so it's a little bit of a turn of the tides. But um, so I like to continue that legacy and think, um, well, I want to give this back. But first, I needed to understand a little bit more about the traditional practices. So what's what is written on them? What is published on them? So we know that their seed propagated. There was there's no known uh, grafting technique at the time that I was doing any literature search. And so that's kind of a, a very interesting thing because, you know, each seed will grow another tree and that fruit can be very different. And so you don't have any consistency, uh, but somehow we've been producing these long enough that there is consistency in the trees that we do have now uh, from seed to seed. They're grown as a multi-stem shrub. So we don't train them, we don't prune them. Um, the only thing that we do prune off of them is the removal of dead branches. The fruit is small, as you saw, uh, and we don't thin the fruit off to gain bigger fruit size, um, though that is something that's been scientifically proven that you can do, but there is also genetics involved in that as well. They are freestone, white fleshed. Uh, some of the uses that were documented is that they're obviously um, eaten fresh, uh, but if they are not, they are sun dried and then they can be boiled. And, um, and so they're easily stored. And you can see these pictures on the screen uh, show the Hopi people uh, splitting them in half and laying them out um, on the rocks to dry. And the lower picture shows the amount of trees in a vast amount of area, all the production of peach trees in the fields, the orchards that, the, that were once uh, abundant in the area. And it was also considered a trade good. So, um, so that's, that's the information that I found out. So learning from that, uh, some of the things that I wanted to learn more is um, I wanted to be able to gather uh, current histories, traditional practices, things that were taught and passed down from generations to generations in the family. I also want to know uh, the importance of the peaches in our communities. You know, there has to be some significance. Um, how long were we growing these? How impactful have they been? Um, I wanted to understand how they were related to modern cultivars, the genetics. Um, and then I also wanted to uh, look at the fruit characteristics and compare the traditional practices to the modern growing practices and see how that affected the fruit production, um, the fruit quality, the fruit size, the fruit sugars, just a lot of different analysis. And then um, I, I pondered the question, well, how old are these trees? So I did some dendrochronology work to determine the age of the trees and the management practices. So that's where um, I'll leave off for a quick discussion break before we get into the real meat of uh, what I started to find out, both on the oral history side and then bringing the science into it to complement each other. I'm on the edge of my seat, so I almost don't wanna interrupt. But I do wanna give a, 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 an encouragement to the folks who are uh, with us on the webinar to do throw some questions into the Q&A. Um, we'll get those queued up and we'll take those as we get further into the discussion. Um, just one question came to mind um, and that was, there is, and I think you've touched on it a little bit, but um, there's some very unique top topography in the Four Corners area in this part of the Southwest. How does that play into um, the conditions for, for growing peaches? And, and why was that perhaps instrumental to their survival, even though it's a, it can be quite arid? Um, that's a very good question. Um, and it's a, lot of, it's a lot of the reason for uh, the research and why I kept going. Um, I just wanna add here real quick before I kind of start touching on that. And I don't wanna say too much because I will definitely bring it into uh, the science into the oral histories, the reason why the, the people like historically have their orchards where they're located. Um, very fascinating question. I don't I don't even know how to really answer that, but um, um, we can we can uh, <laughs> we, we can wait and get back into the presentation if, if you're covering some of that. Um, yes. <laughs> for sure. um, I see a question here. What is dendrochronology? So dendrochronology is the study of tree growth. So looking at the tree rings um, and the analysis of how the tree ages, how many, how many years old, um, the, the tree rings, each ring represents a year of life. Uh, so we'll look at that. Uh, let's see. Uh, 
Okay, so do you think there might be any chance that the peaches would have somehow made their way there from China? Uh, possibly. We will definitely get into that a little bit. Um, has there been genetic analysis to prove how it was introduced? Uh, I'm the first to do that work and you are here to see some of that first work. And uh, I'll just let you know that we're carrying on the work because we just barely got a brief picture of the genetics of the peaches. Um, you know, Reagan, it seems like some <laughs> of the folks are, are asking the questions that are coming up in the next part of your presentation. So yeah. why don't we go ahead and jump into that? <laughs> Okay. And, uh, hear more about it, and then we'll come back in the next break to uh, to some of the questions. Okay, all right. So we'll put a pause on questions. You got some great questions. I'm very excited to answer all of these. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> okay. So as I mentioned, um, I uh, did the work of doing the research with three Na uh, Native American tribes, and if some of you are familiar with any tribal communities. Uh, to do any kind of research specifically is a big step. It's a big hurdle. There's a lot of permissions, a lot of approvals that have to be taken. Um, with the Hopi and the Zuni tribes, just a little bit of background on them real quick. Um, they're called Pueblo tribes. So they live within uh, the, the honeycomb stacked houses on top of each other, uh, which is very well known in that area. And those communities uh, say that they have originated from uh, the Hopi. There's lots of Pueblo tribes uh, in Zuni. I married into the Zuni tribe. Um, they say they are a sister tribe to Hopi, so they don't directly come from Hopi, but they resemble some of, uh, they are rel related to Hopi. But a lot of the Pueblo tribes actually span um, across uh, starting from uh, Interstate I-40, so between Gallup, where you saw, there's also Albuquerque as you go a little bit more east into the state, so the middle middle east, going east, um, is where Albuquerque is, and along that uh, interstate, which we call I-40, there's a lot of Pueblo tribes, so there's tribes like Laguna and Acoma, um, and we keep going, and as you get to the Rio Grande, which spans all the way up um, the North American continent and then goes down into Mexico, uh, that whole river system was a vast system for trading. And so um, it's anticipated that uh, any trading route goes through there between any tribes in Mexico um, and then going into North America. Okay. Um, and then uh, the Navajo community, we saw how vast and spread out it is. But these peaches have been grown in all the Pueblo communities. Uh, the Pueblo communities also span well into the Grand Canyon areas and the tribes that still dwell in the Grand Canyon areas. And, um, and then again, all the way to the Rio Grande. Um, so how we say it uh, in Navajo is uh, didetso. Um, in Hopi, they call it sipala. And in Zuni, they call it mochiqua. Um, so very different words from each other. But these pictures down here, I wanted to show you uh, the picture with all of the kids that's taken um, in the 60s is a picture of my aunts and uncles. Um, my dad is the young boy with overalls hugging the puppy on the uh, far left of the screen. And you can see all of their squash, their melons behind them, um, and, uh, and then the fruit trees, the peaches behind them. Those were the peaches that my dad remembered growing up. Um, and this is the canyon in Shanto that he uh, began raising and farming and herding the livestock in. The picture on the right is a picture I took in 2015 of the exact same area. And those trees in the background are not peaches, they're Russian olives. Um, so you can see the, the vastness of the decline. And when I started researching this and getting a little bit more into it, um, I found a reference through uh, a Hopi agriculture uh, literature source, and it indicates that the peach production in Hopi has decreased to being less than 2% of the original production that uh, was once known uh, to be in the Hopi communities. So um, I say that's the same for Zuni, for Navajo, and for every other uh, Pueblo tribe. Uh, across going all the way to the Rio Grande and even into the Grand Canyon. It's the same circumstances. So the amount of genetic material being lost, the amount of resources being lost, the amount of food being lost in our communities is devastating. 
and um, and we'll kind of go into talking a little bit about why that is. So I started interviewing elders. These are the elders that I interviewed. Uh, there's an asterisk on the side of names that uh, required translation in their communities. And um, one of the, I, these are, some of these are kind of bad pictures. I probably could have updated them, but these are the ones that I originally took and uh, kept for, for my thesis when I wrote it up and I published them. And um, the first picture is, you see me and my son at the time uh, when he was one, uh, he adventured with me everywhere, but that's my dad there. And um, he followed and he's the one that translated a lot of the Navajo uh, uh, interviews. The next picture is uh, Catherine Pamela. She lives in Canyon de Chez. She's a wonderful lady. She uh, tries to live as traditional as she can. And she actually lives down in the Canyon during the summer months to care for all of her crops and the peaches. The next person is uh, Rocky Sinogeny. I interviewed him and uh, his sister and um, he's no longer here. All of them did pass on from COVID, uh, but they have shared so much with me. And a lot of this research was possible because of them and this very historic orchard that they take care of out in Navajo mountain area. Um, the next lady down is uh, May Guy. She gave me the first set of seeds that I collected for this research. Uh, she's no longer here as well. She passed on before COVID, just of um, old age. And the next person is uh, Fred Boani. He's in the Zuni community. He was really great to work with. Um, he gave me a lot of information for another, another crop that I uh, was also studying. Um, I did my thesis, not just on the peaches, but I also did it on what we call Navajo spinach. It's also called a uh, Rocky Mountain bee plant. Um, he gave me a lot of information based off of that plant. And uh, from Hopi, I, I kind of struggled in Hopi a little bit, getting information. Uh, there's a lot of conflict between the Hopi and the Navajo tribe. Some of it's uh, because of uh, reservation boundaries that were put up uh, or end even history of raiding and wars that went on between the Navajo and the Hopi people. So. Um, Lee was very great to work with. He, um, he was the cultural preservation uh, director for the Hopi tribe. Um, he gave me permissions to do the work that I did on the Hopi tribe. And then um, the last picture is Francis Draper. Um, he's a resident out in Canyon de Chez. I interviewed him, um, but they have an orchard that's very, very deep into the canyon that I've never seen um, yet in, in my time uh, on this journey. Um, so the questions that I wanted to ask on, uh, on this part of the project is, um, I, wanted, I wanted to learn about the peach planting process. I wanted to know how they grew them. I wanted to know how they, if they broke the pit, if they didn't, you know, what are the differences? I wanted to know if there was specific farming tools. Uh, what's the irrigation practices? How often would they irrigate them? Uh, were they pruned? How were they pruned? Um, how was the food preserved? How were the trees preserved? Uh, how was harvesting? When did it happen? Um, and then I went on and, you know, I want to know, well, everything that we have in Native American, everything that we do is there's always a prayer uh, that takes place. If there's an herb that we harvest or a medicine that we harvest, we're offering up um, a prayer. We start talking to the plants. We tell them, you know, what we are going to do. Um, we pay a lot of respects to them. Sometimes there's ceremonial processes that go on, uh, religious dances, you know, is there anything like that? That they that they could share with me, um, and then uh, what's what's your family history? How did your family receive the peaches? How did your family plant them? You know, is there anything that you guys have to pass on that you would like to share? That you would like to preserve uh, the memory of these peaches and of your your family? And um, and then I also wanted to know where most of the peaches uh, were grown in the on the reservation before the decline of the populations. Um, and then one other question that I did ask is, uh, why did agriculture uh, begin to decline on in the reservation communities? And I'll answer that real quick here um, because I don't have it in my slides, but that question, a lot of it uh, was due to historical events. So 
Um, there were times like in the 1930s where um, the United States was going through the Great Depression, uh, the Dust Bowl was happening, people were suffering, people were starving. Uh, but the Navajo people and the people on the reservations were actually thriving. We had numerous amounts of livestock. We had our crops flourishing. We had um, moisture in the area that was allowing uh, vast grasslands throughout our communities on, on the Colorado Plateau. And um, a lot of our livestock was taken away and killed at that time. Um, because they, they were telling us that our, our people were overgrazing our lands. And um, so there's destruction periods that happened. Uh, throughout our history, we have uh, the Canyon de Shea events that happened around the Civil War time, uh, the 1930s. And as we get into the 1950s and, and then leaning on, we had some more destruction events. We had property boundaries that were, that were taken away. We had our people warring with each other. Um, we also had our kids going into boarding schools and um, each individual that went to boarding school has a different story. Not every individual has the same story. And there are some very horrific stories. So we had our people starting to be taken away from our cultural practices. Uh, we were being uh, told to migrate into a westernized uh, culture, civilization, behaviors, mindset, everything. And um, and with that was the loss of a lot of our cultural practices, the knowledge of the prayers that were done, uh, the processes that were taking place. And then when our people started to kind of come back, um, luckily I did not experience that process um, like, like my dad did. But um, now as our people are coming back, um, that generation that went to boarding school that experienced some of the worst conditions that are still living today, um, if they have an interest in doing agriculture, now it's very hard and struggling because now there's a lack of water. Um, and so we kind of see a lot of events beginning to unfold one after the other after the other. Our people have been impacted. Um, and so that's a lot of the, uh, an, an added reason to uh, begin starting to preserve this knowledge and, um, and the importance that it is. So, what I started to find out is uh, based off the tribe, the uniqueness of how the tribes actually cared for these seeds. So it's no longer just a general practice. It's now, we're now starting to identify it based on the tribe. So uh, as far as seed propagation, um, it is true that uh, we did do a seed propagation specifically, but I did find an account of uh, grafting taking place in Zuni. And it's not like your typical grafting technique where you take some buds and you graft it on as like a chip bud. Um, it's actually, they would take, as the trees grew in their multi-stem branches, uh, there's an indication of the, the Boani family, one of the, um, I believe the grandparent to uh, Fred Boani, who I interviewed, they um, took an ax and they actually cut off a whole branch of the tree and part of the rooting system. And they would take that whole system and replant it. So that was the grafting technique that they did. And um, it, I don't know an individual that is still doing it, but there is like written accounts that they did do that in Zuni. And that's the only community that I've heard that does that. Um, um, the elders in, um, in all of these areas that I talked to, uh, all told me that they did not plant a seed in their life. And these elders are uh, very old. They were in their 80s, getting to their 90s, some of them. In all instances, they say, I've never planted them, but I was told how to do it. And how we do it is we, you know, some of them would say you can take a hammer and you crack it open and you get the pit out and you plant it in the ground in the fall and let it over winter because peaches do need a chilling cycle to be able to germinate and then you watch for it to come up in the springtime. Some of them would take them and transplant them and spread them out and um, and very interesting things but uh, Canyon de uh individuals that I interviewed they said that they did replant them and it's very interesting to think that because they're uh, they're the, the community that had their trees removed so they had to replant and it's almost as if that replanting act is, is 
as a remembrance of keeping that uh, that food source alive from the uh, from the impacts that they had once seen in their ancestry. Um, there's also indication that uh, there were volunteer seedlings. People would eat peaches, they throw the pits, and they've seen them growing uh, voluntarily um, out through canyon rocks, almost like um, if you've ever been to the Southwest, there's some pictures that I have where, uh, or that I've seen and, and in person where junipers are growing out of the crevices of the sandstone rocks. And you're thinking, how do they even get water? How are they growing there? Well, I've been told that the peaches can do the same thing. Um, as for pruning, only the dead wood is pruned out. Uh, no thinning, as I interviewed Lee Kuan uh, Wisiwima, I have trouble with his name sometimes, it's a really long name, um, but he's from Hopi, and uh, he said that's a cultural no-no when I was interviewing him. He was like, no, cultural no-no, you don't do that. Um, that's your children, you know, you're taking care of them, and you're stopping life in its infancy. And, you know, we don't do that as Native American. Um, and the other thing that was interesting is if there were branches that broke off because they were overbearing by the weight of the fruit, they would, uh, in Zuni, they would mound up the soil and berm around the base of the tree to encourage additional branching around the tree. So there was constant regeneration of these trees over the time of their life. When we, when I asked about irrigation, um, a lot of these trees were placed in canyon areas. Um, we'll look at some of those pictures. So in some of these canyon areas like Canyon Deshaies, there's running water through them. The water table's pretty high. In some of these canyons like Shanto Canyon, uh, Canyon Deshaies, the water table can be uh, five feet below the soil surface. Uh, Navajo Mountain area is the same way, it's canyon lands. And so a lot of the places that the Navajo people planted were in these canyon lands. Uh, as we got to Hopi, they, uh, the Hopi people live on top of a mesa. And if you ever travel to Hopi, uh, their communities are, uh, are identified based off of the mesas that they're in. So they have three mesas. So they have the communities on first mesa, the communities on second mesa, the communities on third mesa. And their villages are on top of the mesas. Um, now, they're starting to dwell below the mesas, but long ago, before they uh, started to adapt and rebuild and spread out, um, they, they continued to stay on the mesas because it was a defense mechanism. They could uh, take care of their people on top of the mesas, but they began to plant their foods in their orchards on the swells off the mesas where the runoff would come off of. So, um, and that's the same way that we've seen in Zuni. So this picture here that you see, um, there's on the, the top part of the picture, there's a huge valley beyond that scene. And uh, that's where the Zuni village is actually uh, at right now. Their pueblos are down there. Um, and we come up and as we come into the Zuni Valley, um, there's mesas at a distance, miles at a distance um, away from the village that come up in their sheer cliffs and they come up maybe about uh, 500 feet above the village. And on these mesas, there are what we call these mesa shelves. And so this picture is showing you one of these mesa shelves. And um, there's not many of them. Uh, there's probably five orchards that I was able to identify um, where the trees were grown within the Zuni reservation on these mesa shelves. Um, and as you look really closely at this picture, you can see um, I'm, I'm all the way down there. This picture was taken by uh, one of my committee members, uh, Dr. Grant Cardin. He's the soil specialist for the, for the Utah Extension. And um, um, he was looking down at us. And um, as we kind of go, let's see, I don't know if the um, arrows, the arrows did not take place. Um, can Let's see, Leslie, can you see my mouse cursor moving on the screen by chance? I sure can. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I'm gonna use my mouse cursor here. So this is one of the peach trees here. And there's another peach tree right here and another one right here. And this is me right here. Um, we were taken to this orchard by my husband. He says, Zuni grew peaches too, I can take you to them. 
And uh, he says, I haven't been here since I was eight. I was on horseback when I was eight and I was riding around and I found this trail path and I'll go ahead and let's see, bring this picture up here. This is the one way down. This is my husband here in the front. This is um, the soil specialist that I was telling you about. He was just starting to come down after he took this picture. That's Grant Cardin. And um, a long time ago, this pathway actually used to be steps, but it had been washed out by flood rains. This is the only way down and only, and if you're standing on top, you're thinking you're just looking at a cliff. You don't even know where you're at. You have no idea that there'd be this mesa shelf. It's completely hidden, tucked away. You could walk along that whole thing unless you knew exactly where it was. Um, and if, um, if I kind of go back and talk a little bit about this, um, and I started going into literature and such, these were um, hideout houses. So these were places of safety and such. And um, and so the people would come up here and they kept their orchards very protected. Um, now, I just want you to recall um, the, some of the stories from the Spanish literature. They spent a lot of time in Zuni. That was one of their, their, their main places of harboring themselves when they were venturing into the Southwestern communities was they stayed in Zuni for many years. And never once did they ever see or say that they, they knew of peach orchards being grown by the people. And, um, and this is a lot of the reason why. They're very hidden, they're uh, tucked away. Some of the orchards actually have ropes to climb up the cliffs to get into these areas to find the home sites. Um, and if you're in the valley, you'd never know that they ever existed. Um, so at a lot of these sites, um, we also did soil analysis and characterization. Uh, they have sandy and sandy loam soils, so well-draining soils. Um, in Zuni and Hopi, they say they don't irrigate. Uh, occasionally um, in Hopi, they say they're having to water their fruit trees now a little bit, but Hopi is very well known for their uh, dry land farming. They don't irrigate any of their plants from the moment that they plant them in the ground. Um, and that goes for their corn, their squash, their beans, melons, everything that they have, chili, um, none of it's irrigated whatsoever. And it's actually a part of their ceremonies that when they do their spring ceremonies and such, they ask for the rain to water their crops um, because they have no intent of doing it, uh, basically. In the Navajo communities, they, um, they irrigate the trees at a very young age. They really baby them, they take care of them in the early years of their growth. And um, they've, they've told me that they, uh, as they mature, they no longer irrigate them, uh, except for a few times per year, if that. Um, if they start to see the trees wilting, they'll put some water on them. Um, some of them, uh, the Cynogenes that I interviewed, they said that they start irrigating them uh, closer to the end of the season when the fruit's ripening. And I want you to kind of uh, remember that a little bit because uh, when we get to the science, we'll start to see the evidence of these practices as we go. Um, so as we harvest, um, the traditionally they are sun dried. We, as I told you, my dad would eat like bellies and bellies full of peaches. You know that was the food. If that was ripening, that's what they ate during the day, um, and or at the time. And anything that they could not fit into their bellies, they started to split them open. So this is what they look like. Um, and uh, Brent Black is my was my major professor for my thesis. Um, he's the one that guided me through a lot of the the analysis that we did. Um, but we we started to see some uh, or hear some instances of modern practices being adopted, such as drying them on screens, um, and they they do store them for the winter use. But the food dishes is what kind of interested me. So um, a lot of our traditional foods are. Um, are all dried. You know, we didn't have refrigeration. We didn't have cans to bottle them. So all of our food that we harvested at the end of the season was dried and then preserved into the, the storage houses, um, which are tucked onto the canyon walls. And um, so if ever we needed them, they would, they would be sealed up for a long period of time, but we could open them and they would all their nutrients, all their freshness would be preserved. Their color, everything is preserved when we store them in our traditional ways. And, um, and so we pull out what we need and the peaches, we would rehydrate them in stews. 
uh, we'd make cobblers uh, with traditional breads and uh, make a peach sauce bread. I mean, listening to the elders talk about this and the memory and they're like, man, I really, you know, I really want this. I actually miss this. They would also make it with corn cake, which is a very traditional food that we had. Um, and that is made for uh, kinadas, which is the, um, the traditional ceremony for young girls uh, starting their womanhood. So it was really interesting. And then I uh, got to the question of um, the tribal stories of the origin and what they say. So starting with Hopi, uh, being the mother tribe of the Pueblos, um, there, there have said, um, even in Canyon de Shea, that they were dwelling in Canyon de Shea before the Navajo people moved into the area. And the Navajo people were estimated to move into the area in the 1700s um, by archaeological evidence. And, um, and so when the Hopi people left, they, they said that Canyon de Shea was actually vacant for, for several centuries. Um, and so when the Hopi people migrated to where they, lo they are currently, um, they've had a lot of influence from archaeologists. Uh, uh, one of their villages is called Old Oribe, and that village has been known as the oldest uh, continually, continually lived in uh, village or community in the entire North American continent. So there's a lot of archeological influence that's come in there, a lot of dating, a lot of excavation work that's been done in the Hopi tribe because they're one of the oldest continually lived in communities uh, to date. And um, so they've been told by dating and, and everything that's been done, what is, uh, but there is still some significance of the peaches in their ceremonies. So as the Hopi people dance in the springtime and welcome all of the harvest and uh, wildlife and everything in their environment to come to life, they actually do these ceremonies in tune with when the peaches begin blooming and when they finish. So when the peaches begin blooming, they begin their dances and their ceremonies. And when the peaches stop blooming, they finish. And so this period of dancing and, cer and ceremonialism celebration period can be a matter of two full weeks. Um, when we get into Zuni, uh, the elders that I talked to, uh, one of the oldest, um, and all of them basically say, well, we're, we don't know where they come from, but we know they've always been there. They've always been growing, uh, since they've been living. One of the oldest elders that I talked to, Thelma Shishi, um, she says, oh, these peaches, you know, I will tell you there is a um, that orchard that I showed you a picture of that is almost completely gone. Um, by the way, I don't think I shared with you that orchard actually had uh, um, several, uh, several tens of trees. So maybe like 40 trees may have existed in that one orchard. And now there's only three in existence there that were barely hanging on for their life at the time that we went down there in 2015. Um, that specific orchard actually has a religious shrine specific for the peaches. So as the Zuni people start their dances with uh, what we call kachinas, uh, they dress up with the masks and they represent like animals or they represent uh, birds in, in our areas or they represent our crops. Um, depending on those kachinas, um, they're the, the priests that do those kachinas based off of their clans and everything, um, they will pilgrimage to these peach orchard sites and they will give offerings uh, for the continuation of the peach orchards and their prosperous uh, sharing. Uh, when we went down there at that time, there was actually a, a cave-in at that shrine site. And um, so we did not see it, we didn't know it existed. And, um, but we were told there uh, that they still go to that orchard specifically and they still pay their offerings and their respects there. Um, another report that I was told from uh, Thelma Shishi and her family is that uh, they found dried peaches below their house. So they lived in one of the old Pueblos, uh, Pueblo houses in the main village. Um, and right next to them is the plaza where they have the, the kachina dancers come in when they do their ceremonies. And she says, we were having uh, the tribe help us with a uh, renovation of our house. And Thelma Shishi, she told me she was 92 years old at the time that I interviewed her. And um, she said that they uh, were redoing the floors in their house and they pulled up the floor and they found this little door 
on their floor. And the contractors opened it and they went down in and um, they said it was set up. If any of you have ever been to the Southwest, a lot of the uh, old ruins, they have specific rooms and how, and, and how the, the rooms are set up. They're very small, they're very square. Um, and so they went into this first room and they found some storage and they went into another room and another room. And I, you know, they went into a few, several of these small rooms and they came to a storage room um, that had old baskets and still seeds in them, uh, corn, beans, they said. And there was this little opening in one of the walls in that storage room. And they said right there were some dried peaches. And they said, we didn't know, we don't know how old it is, but this is Thelma Shishi, 92 years old. Her family's lived in this house for generations and generations. And she didn't remember anybody telling her about the, the understory that was below them buried in the ground. And, um, and so when I asked them, I said, did you have any archeologists come in and take a look at it? And she says, no, we didn't allow anybody to come in. We didn't let anybody from the tribe say bring archeologists in they said we told the contractors to board up the floor and cover it over so as we were sitting in their kitchen they said it's right below us um, but we don't know how old it is or how long it's been there and then as I started to get into uh, my area my communities the Navajo people there were three accounts uh, from the uh, from from these that were not uh, that were secondhand accounts that I was told that people had been uh, going through the canyons around Navajo Mountain area and that there were a few ruin sites that they saw peaches sitting in some of these Anasazi ruin sites, untouched, um, still sitting there in those storage areas. And um, so to me, it was really interesting, you know, why uh, our people had these stories. So, um, I think I, I also kind of want to add here real quick, um, if I may, that as I was uh, talking with my husband on some of our origin stories and how the Pueblo tribes broke off from one another, the Hopi tribe is considered the mother tribe to all the Pueblo tribes. And then Zuni is a sister tribe to the Hopi tribe. So they don't exactly break off, but they relate themselves to the Hopi people. The other Pueblo tribes that span across the, the all the way to the Rio Grande, um, they say broke off of Hopi and they started to migrate towards the Rio Grande and then down. And, um, and so when we talk about those origin stories and the travels and, you know, there's really no way to date the migration years or anything because we just have our stories to pass down. But we know that this happened a very long time ago. And as that process happened, these each of these Pueblo tribes that broke off of Hopi and how they migrated, uh, to the east, they also say we took seed from from these, you know, our mother tribe as we migrated and migrated and migrated. And so to me, a pathway of the migration of these seeds would be from Arizona into New Mexico. So I started to really think about this and, and put it together. And I, you know, I, I had a lot of speculations and, but I kept being told, let's put the science behind it. Let's put the science behind it. We don't have any definitive answers, um, but to be able to give back respect to our people and the understanding, uh, the work that I was doing, I was really excited and gung ho. And I was like, okay, let's get the science and put it together. So that's the next piece of the story that I'm going to share with you. Um, and so we'll take a break for, for some questions now. Let me just ask one quick one, and then I want to make sure because we're at eight thirty-five right now on our time. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and I want to make sure that we've got time because the next section that you have on science is really great. Can you really briefly tell us um, when you approached the elders? Were they forthcoming with information, and specifically the actual peach seeds? Um, it was a, it was actually a struggle. Um, there's, there's probably so much I can tell. The first seeds I got, there was, uh, uh, was from the Navajo communities and, um, they, they gave, um, uh, Catherine Pamela was a little hesitant. She goes, you know, this is not for you to make money on. And so I took that to heart. I'm not interested in making money on this whatsoever. Um, I'm, I'm looking to preserve it and provide it to my people first and foremost. You know, if they need a seed, I want to be able to give it to them free. Um, and so that's uh, with um, 
the Hopi community was a little bit more challenging. My husband definitely helped there. Uh, we started trading uh, Zuni salt, which is highly salt for in all of our tribal communities. It's used in our ceremonies and everything. And so he used the salt to be able to get our family seeds. So we have, we have a starting collection of seeds from Hopi and from uh, some areas in Navajo and in Zuni now um, that we've been able to use for our own gardens and such. And was there an element of wanting to protect and preserve these peaches for, yeah. the, for the culture? Yeah. Yes, well, um, some people were, were very open and like, here, you know, if this is what you're going to do, uh, go ahead and take these, uh, take what you need. Um, the elders in Navajo Mountain, you know, they gave me the most that I could ever ask for. They gave me like, like five pounds of seeds, basically, that I had on reserve. And, you know, and I felt, you know, I can't ask for more. I have what I have and I have to work with what I have because each seed can give a tree and that's an abundance amount of food, you know, so. So it makes sense that you would be um, trying to preserve these and treat them as a very precious commodity. Yes. Um, because in the fruit growing world, we're, we're, the minute somebody says they have an interesting cultivar, we all say, particularly within NAFEX, you know, can I have some of that? And can I try and grow it where I am? And we try to share that. And so I, but I can understand why you would not be wanting to be in that, in that mode. Yeah. Point. Yeah. At this point, I'm, I'm trying to conserve all the resources that I have to continue out the genetics, to uh, preserve the populations. And, and I'm, I struggle at this point of identifying locations to make sure that these populations are not outcrossed. Um, and so if we're ready, I'll, I'll go ahead and start um, the science. Oh, please I'll try do. and go through the science as fast as I can because it's very straightforward and cookie cutter. Um, okay, so this is where I collected seeds. This is a geography. Um, you can see the four corners point on the, the map. And um, I have an arrow over by Shanto. There is a uh, source that I found in Farmington, New Mexico area um, of these peaches growing in those areas, but I, I lost the trail. And as I showed you, uh, Shanto no longer has any fruit trees growing in that area. Um, I found locations in Zuni, but I was not able to collect any seed from Zuni just because the trees were uh, not very, they're not thriving in those areas. There's not a lot of uh, seeds to, to be able to get good pits from. So starting off with the genetics, um, the first seeds that I got from Canyon de Shea, this is a picture of them here. Their leaves are very flat, actually. They're not curling, uh, very young leaves. And uh, this is something that was very interesting is my uh, major professor, when he saw these growing uh, a few months after, they were kind of getting massive. They were two feet tall. They were spread out. And he, we were walking through this greenhouse that he has all of his research in. And he goes, what are these? And I told him, I said, these are the peaches, the Navajo peaches. And he goes, oh, really? And I said, yeah. I was like, aren't you, you know, aren't you a permaculturalist? Like, don't, don't you know? And he, <laughs> you know, so it was kind of a little bit of a funny thing, but even he had a, a little bit of a hard time, you know, saying, what is this? It's not, it doesn't look like your typical peach. So um, I germinated these and we transplanted them in an orchard in Thatcher, Utah. That's where all of my trees are located right now that I have. Um, but to do the genetics, we freeze dried the leaves um, and they have to be young leaves, so actively growing leaf tissue to be able to get very viable uh, uh, DNA out of them. And we did what we call um, genotyping by sequencing, which is an extraction of the DNA. So you get a subsample of, of the DNA uh, strands, and, um, and that way you can kind of get a, a picture, begin to piece together this, uh, this genome, and, um, or the germplasm. Um, and so uh, I worked with uh, the peach breeder over at Clemson University. Her name is Dr. Kasenja Gasic. She's been phenomenal to work with and we're continuing the work out today. And then to do analysis, um, I don't, I'm sure some of you are probably not uh, geneticists, uh, but if you are, uh, we used Plink, uh, which is a software, uh, genetic software um, to uh, do, and fast structure to be able to analyze the genetic data. So um, this is the dendrochronology work. I'm just kind of going through the methods here. Uh, we've got some amazing pictures here of some of the trees and how many are on their life's edge. Uh, these two trees down here on the bottom pictures were apricots. 
Um, and then we have these stumps. So we sampled these stumps and identified them as either peach or apricot. Uh, apricot's very similar to peach and they are growing among the, the peaches as well in these orchards. Um, this is from an old orchard out near Navajo uh, mountain area. We got a lot of samples from this orchard, but as you can see, they've just, they've just died and the stumps are laying there. I, I have an amazing picture of just seeing a whole row of stumps like this just laid down and dead. This is an old orchard in uh, Zuni, actually, um, on near their sacred mountain. And uh, we took pictures. This is one of the trees. And then we have some other trees that are coming up. And you would never realize what this was. You would think it was juniper trees walking through it. But as you get on top, you can see the strategic uh, row by row planting that they had of the peach trees in this area. So we sampled them and um, sanded them down to count the, the tree rings, get a good visibility. And this is what one of the samples looked like. This is my dad, he's helping me uh, cut through. It, it, was a, it was work on the chainsaw because of all the sand and the termite damage that had been done. So we were able to piece together what we could. Um, and then we also did fruit collections. So this is one of the old orchards, uh, the, the orchard that we were sampling from in Navajo Mountain area. You can see the canyons in the back and the vast area. Um, this is my mom here. This is an apricot tree, very massive. And it just kind of keeps going and they have their squash, their melons. This is probably the most traditional agriculture, Navajo agriculture that you'll ever see. Um, and, um, and then this is the peach trees that I grew in that little container that I showed you. Uh, we transplanted them out. This is how big they are. I put bird netting around them to save the little bit of fruit that I had so I could do uh, the sampling and analysis that we did for the fruit collection. So looking at the fruit size, um, we uh, have a baby gold seedling that was grown in the same orchard, that Thatcher orchard. Um, and um, it, uh, you know, it came from baby gold. So uh, the mass of it is very big, as you can see, uh, around 200 uh, grams. But the fruit that we collected from the Navajo communities, we have this Canyon de uh white peach that I transplanted. This was grown in Thatcher. So it had a little bit more mass, a little bit more weight. Um, so this tree and this tree were both grown at the Thatcher Orchard, but this Navajo Mountain tree and Navajo Mountain uh, white and yellow flush peaches were both grown at that orchard that I showed you. Um, then we get into what we call the, the flesh to pit ratio. So mesocarp is the peach flesh. Um, and uh, looking at the size of the fruit and their proximity to that. So we see some of the same things. So there's actually less flesh uh, in comparison to the pit. Um, I think that can definitely be seen, uh, but interesting enough, this Canyon de Shea white peach that was grown in Thatcher, Utah, had a little bit more variability in it. Um, and then we get into the quality. So we start looking at the fruit density. Um, a lot of people want a little bit more of a dense fruit, uh, but interesting enough, the Navajo Mountain fruit is less dense. So this sample and this sample from Navajo Mountain were less dense and, um, than the Canyon de Shea uh, peaches grown over in Thatcher that I had germinated and, and started to collect fruit from. And then this baby gold seedling again. I just picked a random seedling that I was able to identify in that orchard, which is um, part of a breeding orchard project, by the way. Um, and then we wanted to look at the dry matter. So uh, they have uh, less dry matter content. Um, and so it was, it was just kind of really in interesting. You have fruit that's less dense, um, and then they also have less flesh than uh, something grown in traditional practice. And a lot of this had to do with part of the irrigation. So um, the fruit that was grown over at Navajo Mountain, they were very irregular on their irrigation pathway. And so when we talk about the fruit development process, um, the fruit start to divide and uh, develop their cells in their tissue at a very young age. And so they do that at the first stage of their life. And if they're not getting the water um, resource that they need to put on more cells, um, they only grow a certain amount of cells and then they stop. And then when they begin to get irrigated at the end of the season, they start to pack on a lot of water weight. And so we started to see the traditional practices in comparison um, in especially this uh, dry matter uh, point and the density. 
Um, then I started to do some literature search. I reached out to some historians in New Mexico and I was like, well, let's look at the seeds. Let's see if there's any archaeological evidence in the seeds. We really didn't find anything, but um, all of these sites are archaeological seed sites from samples in New Mexico areas. And, um, and this is, we decided to average them because we weren't seeing anything. So we thought, well, let's take an average and see if there's something we can look at. But even so, from the seeds that I've collected and some of the locations that they were grown in, um, the seed from a level seedling area and those seeds and where they were grown, um, these are much larger in comparison, uh, but there was still, um, uh, they're, they're, the level does not compare too much to any of the other seeds, even if I've grown them in traditional practices or, or if they were um, grown in modern conditions. So we didn't really get anything there, but I wanted to share that with you and say that we did start to look into that and see if there was any kind of anything with archaeological uh, findings of, of peach pits. Um, and then we get here to the fruit nutrition. So we got a, a, an FDA uh, analysis, food nutritional analysis done on some of the Navajo white peaches that we collected over in Navajo Mountain. They show that they're higher in calories, calcium, fiber, carbohydrates, and total fats. So that's where these arrows are indicated here. And we compared it to the uh, USDA standard label for fresh peaches. And then um, they're lower in protein and fatty acids, which you can see at these arrow locations here. And then um, we didn't really see a difference in uh, total sugars or uh, total minerals altogether. Potassium to me looked higher, but my main advisor said, you know, there's not really a, a, a significant difference in um, all of his studying with, with fruit production. So here's the genetics I wanted to share with you. We took uh, 20 modern accessions or modern peach cultivars and we compared them to the peaches that we had. Uh, these modern accessions are uh, from the US. So some of the, the leading uh, peach cultivars that were first brought into the United States on the Eastern coast and then also into California and are now producing the peaches that we have today. And uh, we took some from Mexico, from Brazil, Spain, Syria, and Asia. And um, interesting enough, the peaches that uh, we had, these are all the modern accessions here on top. They grouped well with each other. Uh, they've got a pathway from each other. But then the peach sources that we had that I collected um, don't group with those accessions. And they also have regionally uh, diverted from each other. And so what we saw in the genetics pathway is that they were uh, heavily inbred populations. And um, the interesting thing is we did identify a few from Hopi, these HTM with their numbers uh, are indications of uh, the populations from Hopi that I collected. We saw some of those outcrossing. And so what we see in the Hopi communities now is the traditional peaches. And then we also see uh, modern cultivars being brought in. And so um, one thing to add to the history is uh, when the people were coming back into their communities in the 1800s from the Long Walk, um, and then even later, uh, the federal government actually did provide uh, fruit trees to replace the ones that they had cut down at the time so the people could, could have their food source again. But the, the Native Americans in the Canyon de Chez area uh, kept them separate. And I was told that by the elder uh, May guy, she says, I'm giving you these seeds. I had to make sure I said, are these the ones? She says, I kept them separate to make sure that they did not cross. Um, so there was already indication that, that our elders wanted to keep them separate and they knew that they were different. So this is just a little bit more additional analysis. So we did a PCA analysis to look at the the grouping visibly, um, and then the fast structure analysis. So it's just uh, more of the same, the same stuff that I was talking about. Um, and then when we get to the dendrochronology, I started to count the tree rings on the trees, and um, I found what they call missing rings. So sometimes if uh, dendrochronologists are looking at like a juniper tree, um, sometimes there's several years in junipers that the trees actually do not produce a tree ring. And so they're missing. Um, and when they're cross-dating, they're able to identify how many missing rings a tree may have. I actually found some missing rings on these peaches. And because there wasn't enough samples and not a lot uh, um, enough to be able to, to come from, we weren't able to do any cross-dating with them. 
the other concern is that I told you with the management practices that um, they encourage uh, new growth to generate from these trees. So if a branch breaks off, they'll encourage new ones and there'll be new branches. And there's no way to actually date uh, a root ball of the living tree. There's only the picture in time that we can get from the trunk. And so um, we saw the ages of this. The other thing to add on this is some of these samples were very weathered, very old. And so when I asked the dendrochronologist that I worked with, you know, how many years could be taken away? And he says, well, in a desert climate with the time that they've been out there, we could look at adding on, you know, another 20 years to their life uh, from what you can see here. And so, I mean, we can take what I actually counted and add another 20 years and we're putting these trees just one trunk one branch at 100 years potentially of their life and then um, i have here the basal area increment uh, analysis which uh, which gives you a picture of since we weren't able to cross date them let's now look at their life and compare the rings amongst themselves within their life and then compare that with all of the samples so we're basically starting every start point at a year of their life and looking at how they grow basically and so um, with Zuni, as you saw those orchards, there's absolutely no irrigation. There's almost no variability in their ring, gro ring growth from, from year to year. And so that tells us that, you know, there's not a lot of added irrigation. As we get to Hopi, there was some of that added irrigation. Um, and one thing that I don't have here to share for you is, is the pathway of year to year and year and that variability. Um, but you can see that variability and how it occurs. Um, the growth uh, increment variability, we have more variability in Navajo Mountain. As we saw, it was very inconsistent. That's what the elders were telling us of how they irrigated their crops. And so we were seeing a lot of that inconsistency in the samples. There's a lot of variability. Um, and less in Canyon de Chez as they, you know, water at the beginning of their life and then they start to decrease towards the end. And, um, and same thing in Hopi and Zuni, there was, you know, uh, very little variability. So very interesting. It started to, uh, to coordinate with what the elders were saying. So in conclusion uh, to my research and what I've done and, and what I'm working to do is um, we found the management practices were unique to each tribe and even within each community. Um, the irrigation uh, uh, that we found, you know, we found that through the dendrochronology. And then also we saw the, that evident in the fruit observations that we collected uh, through the Navajo Mountain Orchard. The lifespan can be ranged from 80 to 100 years. And, um, and then uh, 70 to 80 years is what we found in confirmed rings on average. Uh, we saw the missing rings. And then I also wanted to add in that multi-stem growth again. Um, and then the, the other interesting thing is when we bring in the genetics, we have isolated inbred populations. And the one thing that I want to add here is I spoke with the, the geneticist that I'm working with, and I said, so how do you get an inbred population? She says, well, if you take a seed from, from a tree and you plant that, and um, you let it self-pollinate itself, which peaches can self-pollinate, um, self-pollinate itself and then plant that. And so you do that six times, six generations, you can then start to see an inbred individual. And I said, well, these trees, these orchards are grown in communities. So what happens if you add several trees that are similar and you grow them out? And she says, well, it can take, now you're talking 50 generations of doing that, uh, that replication over and over and over, and then you can start get, to get an inbred population. And so, I mean, we're talking 50 generations now because these do grow in communities. Um, we cannot say that there was one tree that started and then started and started six times, and now we have our inbred population, you know, um, and then we look at the age of the trees and the traditional management practices, and now you're thinking, how old are these? How old are these orchards? How old, how long have these been in our communities? Um, it's a very significant part of our communities. You know, I've done some of the cultural information. Um, and one thing to add, this is, this is something that needs to be preserved, and that's the focus that I have moving forward now, because it is a nutritious food source, um, it's going to be a benefit to our communities, and so the future direction that I'm going with this is we're doing and continuing the genetics work, we're going to add to that genetics information that we've collected, we're going to add more individuals to those populations, um, and then the next thing is to preserve this genetic resource. I mentioned I don't have a lot of seeds. Um, and I don't feel uh, right to ask for more because culturally they've given me a lot of food to sustain myself and my family. 
So I'm bound with the resources that I have. I've been asked uh, by a lot of people, can I have some seeds? Do you have these for sale? I'm not looking to sell these. Um, I don't have a lot of seeds at this time, but that's what I'm working to do. I'm working to uh, help these canyons become productive and abundant. That's where I'm at in the stage of life. And my career has very much so helped me to begin that pathway. Um, and some other things that I want to add here is we are going to be looking at the root growth patterns because we did a drought tolerance study as well before I graduated my thesis. It's not a part of my thesis, but um, we did see that they are drought tolerant. So we compared them to um, a level seedling and uh, grew the Navajo seedlings and the level, hole, level in containers in a randomized experiment inside a controlled greenhouse within a controlled environment. We monitored how we watered them and the Navajo trees recovered very fast compared to the level. Um, we also saw that they put on more leaf area. So they had more leaves on their canopy. They grew more on top, but their root system was constrained and smaller. So they didn't have as much of a rooting system. Um, so it was very interesting and it's a common characterization that we can see with uh, other drought, uh, drought tolerant species as well. So we are calling them uh, more drought tolerant. And so it's kind of an eye pointing finger of, can we use this as a rootstock in the fruit uh, production industry? Um, that's something that I'm, you know, I'm kind of hesitant on. I have to put a lot of restrictions because um, these are, uh, uh, individuals that are very uh, culturally significant to our people. Um, and we don't want to abuse them. We don't want to abuse their resource and their life and their abundance. They've proven to grow for hundreds of years and are bountiful and productive. And um, every year they, you know, as long as there's not a late frost, they provide an abundance of fruit and they just keep giving and giving and giving. And so um, as I move forward, I'm also looking to be culturally respectful to the plants. Um, every time I go to the Thatcher orchard, I talk with them and I tell them, you know, you're being cared for. I love you and thank you for everything that you're giving. And, um, you know, that's, that's where this picture is taken is this is the first harvest that I had this year, first bountiful harvest I was able to sample from all of the trees. Um, so I'm happy to share this with you today um, <laughs> and tell my story in a little bit more of uh, what it means to me and how it's it's a life journey, it's a cultural journey for me. Um, it's not just um, a way to make money. It's not just, uh, I mean, I don't know what else to add, but um, that's what it is for me. It was absolutely wonderful, Reagan. Thank you so much. Um, I don't think there is anything that you need to add. It was absolutely a wonderful 90 minute session. I'm so happy it's being recorded and will be shared with others. So um, we're out of time. So um, on behalf of the North American Fruit Explorers, I wanna thank you, Reagan, for making this so informative and such an important and meaningful session. Thank you. Um, so once again, this recording is gonna be made available on the nafex.org webpage for the coming year. Uh, all you have to do is join, it's only $19 and um, you can have access to all this great content um, on our site. Uh, Reagan's presentation is available in the Google Drive for download. So feel free to uh, get on there. It's on the same page with our conference links and you'll see the ability to download it from her folder. So I encourage you to do that. Uh, and in a year from now, we'll post this on our uh, NAFEX YouTube channel, as I said earlier. So um, there is also other downloadable content from the other sessions. So I encourage you to go check that out. Don't miss our other sessions that are upcoming in the conference, including our annual meeting tomorrow uh, midday. That'll be noon Pacific and 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. So please come to that, learn more about our organization, how you can get involved. Um, and do stay connected on social media. As I said earlier, we've got a really robust Facebook group, but we're also on Instagram and Twitter. So please stay connected with us there. Um, thank you again, Reagan. And thank you to everybody for joining us for this webinar. And have a wonderful evening. Thanks.